Hey, look at that. We're live. All right. We are live. <laughs> All right, guys. What is it? COVID time slip. Happy Thursday. Uh, here again with my good friends. Uh, to my right, Sean Tiford, hailing from West Philadelphia, born and raised. Just kidding. Um, and then below me, um, a good friend of mine, Michael Shane, hailing from Louisville, Kentucky. How are you guys? Good. How are you holding up in NYC? Snowed in, but for now we're okay. <laughs> well, this is you are used to this though, right? Like, yeah. I I mean, it snowed once in Atlanta, two inches, and they shut down the entire city. I mean, it's, just, <laughs> it's all relative to what you're used to, you know. Yeah, the city treats snow actually pretty well, um, for the most part. They're a lot of trucks and organized. They were salting roads yesterday. Buses had chains on the tires. I'm sure Sean, like you've seen, how Philly treats snow. They, it's usually pretty organized. Yeah, and I've seen. I mean, I haven't worked in Manhattan in ten years, but you know, I I was used to that as well. So, yeah. <laughs> Um, well, among the uh, things that we're going to talk about today, one is the lost art of trading between collectors and friends. Um, so I'll kind of open it up to Sean and Michael because they just completed a rather large and intricate trade with each other. So I'll leave it kind of to you guys to framework it and kind of talk about what all you guys needed in the, in the trade in, in your own collection. So. Have at it, guys. Okay, Sean, um, you go first? Or? Sure. So basically, I, I forget who approached who at this point, but I know I think I put the – at some point I put an offer out that I know, Michael, you collect tomorrow. You want one very, very good example of each hand card. Whereas I know Brian and I, we, we have, we'll have multiples of all different cards. Um, and so I had a couple of – I think pretty re pretty good grades on on cards, um, and Michael. I think at that point you said you had um, a postcard that both you and Brian had seen very few of. So we kind of that was I think the starting basis of how could we work something out, um, and that was just a figuring out of. Personally, I just wanted a decent example of cards. So if I give you the high grade, you give me. You know what basically what it would be replacing from your your side and then you know that difference we'd cover like with the postcard if and then that's how we basically worked it out it wasn't a you know and I, I know all we all see a lot of people are you know crunching numbers of you know what's this going for what's that going for no it was like i think i ballpark you know, okay it's going up two grades you know do this amount go at one grade do this amount and you know, we try and be fair with one another because we're not looking to um it's not a, a monetary transaction at this point it, it's it's a way to improve both of our collections at the same time exactly i can be 100 percent with that now uh, it's, it's when you find people that collect similar interests as you some people look at that as a competitor on like on ebay and such whereas if you approach it more, you know, don't make these your enemy, make these your friends. Because if we all have the same collecting goal, and all of us collect Greenberg, but we all do it a little differently. And if we can help each other get pieces we need for our collection, um, then do the trade. Don't worry what you say about how much it's worth. Just say, this is what I'm looking for. This is what you're looking for. Let's see what we can work out where we're both happy. And I don't want to see comps on anything. This, this is discuss it and this, you know, let's try to help each other out here. Because if you treat your, if you want to call them rivals, if, if you get to be friendly with them, you're going to help each other and advance your collection much quicker than trying to outbid them on eBay all the time. And uh, when I saw that you didn't have that post, you know, I know now we've gotten to get to know you quite well. And uh, I knew I had two of those postcards. I figured this one, but one of these belongs in Sean's collection. And this so is the postcard is. in question. 
And uh, it's a great it's picture. Like, I mean, come on. I, I mean, it's nice having you, too, but if I can help you out, then you can find a way to help me out. It's a win-win situation the way I look at it. And we really don't know what it's worth. I mean, because we're not going to put it on eBay to find out. I mean, there's, no, there's no sales of those type cards, hardly ever. So who knows type things. I'm very happy with the trade. I know yeah. you are too. So. so why don't you show us what you got in the trade, John? Well, I just showed the postcard. To me, that was you know, the key piece for me because we can all agree there's not many of these out there. Then this is postmarked July 25th, 1936, with a single, you know, first name stick on it. Um, just as a sidebar, it's funny, I know I showed both of you. So this was uh, July 25th, 1936. I think a couple days before I had purchased this, the government issue postcard, postmarked July 25th, 1946. Both going to North Carolina for some reason. <laughs> uh, so that was um, the main piece. I think the other big one for me was uh, the Mensor Uban. That's a tough card, too. I've only seen maybe, oh, goodness, two or three maybe over the last six, eight years I've been doing the Jewish players. And it's probably the best four you're going to see in this card, too. Yeah, it's nice. Very nice. It's, it's very, very clean. And that's um, another example where I won the men's are off that last at one auction. And I'm I'm more of a fan of the picture co postcards or cards yeah. that actually shows a real life photo. Kind of like Andrew with Nuff said. I mean, I, I just love his stuff because everything is picture cards. And that's a, if I had the money, I would incorporate some of what he collects into my collection too. But his is on another stratosphere. You got to see him like not too long ago, didn't you, Brian? Yeah, I uh, I did the Chantilly show with Andrew and was able to see his collection in person. It was quite magnificent. So, Andrew, if you watch this, <laughs> shout out to you in your magnificent collection. And then, well, the point is, you know, Mike, Michael, you threw these in. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so this is... I just found it interesting because this is the was it 2011 try started an OBAC design. So you have the original and then you have <laughs> modern. That's true. Look at that uh, Greenberg one though. I love Greenberg, but that card, that OBAC, is yeah. that one of the worst looking cards you've ever seen in your life? Yeah, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it looks like uh, a nuclear bomb went off in the background behind him. <laughs> because they have no license and there's like nothing on his jersey or his head. It's just like he's wearing a white uniform. And then, so the next one is uh, the 36, 39 to 46 exhibit. Um, and this is an upgraded grade for me. Yeah, Brian just saw an interesting article on those, didn't you, Brian? What's that? Didn't you, did you post that article or did Sean post that? Oh, I shared it. Yeah. But I got that. I have to give credit because he's in the chat with um, Alex from Bowen53. He shared that with me first. So the article essentially goes like instead of buying a blaster for $20, buy a, a 39 to 46 exhibit in Greenberg for $20. It's a pretty good argument. Nah, yeah. I agree with that. There's a lot <laughs> of good players in that set you could buy, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. And nice. even, even the signed one through the. Uh, 39 to 46, or even the later editions for exhibits are actually relatively inexpensive. So I have a really nice um, Ralph Kiner um, signed exhibit. Um, I was able to pick up for pretty cheap. I think it was under, I think it was like 40 bucks. Is that a large set? What was that? Is that a large set? Yep, got me. I would assume there's a lot of cards in that set, but. It would be a fun one to put together, I would think. Yeah. Um, and then I, it, this is a throw-in, a Goody Rosen <laughs> photo. But there's not a whole lot of cards of him either. 
and there's only the 39 um, he was said he was in of his major releases. And then these are fun. And Michael, you and I enjoy these, the signed newspapers. Yeah. Because, you know, I think I have this original photo, and you probably have one of the um, press copies as well. I think somewhere. Um, and then you threw this one in. I actually had the numbered version of this card. I did not have the base one. So great picture of Hank on that one too. Yeah, nice early picture. Yeah. Trying to avoid glare. And then, so the two cards that you upgraded. So you basically sent the grades that you had. Um, two batter ups. The um, black. So. I'm going down to a 1.5, which I am perfectly fine with. I love that stamp on the back. The stamp yeah. is so cool. And the funny thing is I have one of these raw, which I think I'll get probably a four or five. That's amazing. Um, and then this is a downgrade for me. So this is, this is an older SGC slab. It's six, it'll be a five, I believe, in the blue. Yeah, I got that slab many a year ago. So that was, those are the downgrades for me, which again, I'm fine. I have examples of the card. That's the <laughs> most important thing for me. Um, so, Mike, so that was my end, what I received. So, Michael, now you can go over what, uh, what well, I ended up sending you. And again, thank you for your gener generous throw-ins. I, I had two. I've already put them up. I had two large stacks of bench cards you sent me. Probably at least fifty, I guess. I mean, it was a huge stack of bench cards. And um, you threw in this wonderful Kofax. Now I'm, I'm probably the only person in the world that doesn't collect Project 2020. Uh, I've never cared anything about those at all, now, but you did show me this Kofax a while back that you bought, and I gotta admit it's it's pretty daggone cool with the Hebrew style lettering, and um, it's uh, just a very cool card. So this is gonna be my one Project 2020 card right here, and thank you for throwing that in, Sean. Yep. Uh, but the gist of it was the postcard and the two upgrades. And I got one postcard from you back. It's nice. And I'm assuming that's like a George Brace card. He yep. signed a lot of these, so I assume later this was his go-to for answering mail. You still got a blue ink one of these, right, John? I do, and I have it slabbed. Yeah. That'll go to PSA uh, eventually. And I like that, that one because it's, it's a very nice, clear signature on it. Yeah, it's clean as can be right there. And then the batter ups, I sent you the 1.5 and got back uh, 2.5, which is hard to say with um, SGC what they'll do with the crossover. I'm hoping to get at least a two for it. And then the bigger one was I sent you the five blue and I got back your seven. Blue, which uh, old style holder, but uh, hopefully they'll go. I'll see what they'll do with it. I'm afraid to send anything to SGC right now. Um, yeah, I was glad to finally get my stuff back. I did a video. I, I went 148 business days. I waited for that. But the part that really disappointed me more so than even that was the fact that when I dealt with them in communication, they were they really didn't care. And that really disappointed me, considering what they used to be, especially when they were up in New Jersey near Bryan. It was a different company. They were smaller. They took care of the collectors. And um, yeah, I know how business is. you got to be growing all the time and blah, blah, blah. But. It disappointed me how little they cared about making me happy with the cards or making any effort. I mean, after like 120 business days, uh, that Tyler guy told me, we can't bump your cards up above anybody else. It's still going to be a few more weeks. 
And this is after 120 business days dated May 19. I'm like, and I'm seeing tons of videos of cards sent back after that date. So all those people didn't get bumped ahead of me already? And you can't bump me back up a little bit here and take care of this? It just made me lose respect for the company. And um, to me, they're just another PSA is all they are now. And that's fine. I'll, I'll do my business with them as a PSA type company because I like their cards, their product better still than PSA. But I still have to deal with PSA just to get their autographs grab now. So what can you do? But anyway, getting back, I, thank you for those two upgrades, Sean. I really love them. And the postcard and you threw in this beautiful new National Treasures booklet, number the 10. Yeah. And I only have three of those now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got one. You've got how many? Two? Three, I think. Three of them, man? Are you going to yeah. get all the other nine of them, hopefully? No. <laughs> But that's just a wonderful trade. I was super happy. We didn't really look up prices for anything. We didn't uh, do that. We just kind of helped each other get what we needed. And uh, we might be doing another trade here in the near future. Who knows? Uh, if y'all are still interested, I got the, the five. Gowdy. Um, yeah, we're going we're gonna to work a trade on that one. <laughs> uh, because I did get the six in in that last order. So about me, it's not so much. I'm not, Brian and Sean like to have duplicates. I don't keep any duplicates. I, if I have an extra one, to me, it's a card to use to get other things, not something to sit on type thing. But that's just how I am. I'm trying to do a complete master set. So I'd prefer to trade for something. I need to knock out another card off that set if I can. And, and it's interesting because, like, I so Michael, the way that you collect Greenberg is kind of the way I collect Kofax. So, because Kofax can get astronomical too. Um, but I actually got rid of a lot of um, duplicates I had of Kofax because they're just easier to find. Um, oh, and use those funds to get some of the Greenberg cards I was missing. Um, because all the pre war stuff, as you guys have both seen, is drying up. Oh, uh, God. It's amazing. And the prices that people are getting here buying these were just insane. It is. You know, some things for Hank we'll never get. I mean, that Al Demeray card is only what, one in existence that they know of. And I doubt that guy's ever going to sell if it's got it. So, you know, what can you do? But uh, I'm going to try to knock out as many off the list as I can eventually. Well, I think the Burke photo, I'm still missing. The, was it the Ferris Furs? I know I'm still missing. I think you'll find one of those. Yeah. Um, you think that Brian's got an extra that you can pry off of him, maybe? I don't know. Brian's oh, looking at the, the, the four in one exhibit. I'm still missing that one. The what? The, the exhibit. Oh. The four in one. You, you uh, forgot the Michigan Sports Service. Michigan. Well, there's a handful of cards that I don't know if you that are almost non-existent. One day we'll go over. I don't have it prepared, but I'll go over the checklist of what's left on my. It's getting down to just a few, but there are a lot of things I think that may not exist, or there's just a handful that are never going to see the light of day type thing. Now, Michael, I know with with if you're doing the complete kind of checklist. Are you going to try and do all the different 36 back varieties? Oh, no, no, no. I mean, there's some things <laughs> you have to you have to draw the line somewhere. I just want an example of everything. And some things I am doing rainbows or like that epic set. Uh, there's like 11 variations of that. I'm doing, I've got like seven of them now. And I will get you one of those epics too. And, um, but it just gets to a point where you, it's like bench. I mean, bench is my other PC, and it's just got to a point I feel like I'm chasing my tail all the time. Now. So it's better to walk away from it for a while and just because uh, Tops is just going to keep on cranking out tons and tons and tons. You know, him and Ripken are probably the most, I would say, the two that sign the most probably in the market right now. 
as far as for tops, yeah. Chris Sanders has started not too long ago. I mean, he was a Tufts autograph for a long time until all these Tufts products started coming out, and they got an exclusive with him. So if it wasn't for Tops, Copax autos wouldn't be that common as far as a you know a packed issue type car. Well, the interesting thing with Copax autos is Tops' exclusive contract with Copax ran out. So he's now in Panini products. Is he with Panini now? I didn't know that. He's now with Panini products as well. Because I've been wow. noticing National Treasures, Flawless, I think. I know National Treasures, but I think Flawless as well. Kovac has been popping up for autos. I didn't know that. When did his contract expire? It must have been this year, because I'm only seeing 2020 products for Panini. Huh. And Tops, he's added any Tops products this year? Yeah. Yeah, he was in um, yeah. Tops Chrome Black most recently. Yeah. That yeah. Came out of years ago. Okay. So it's just no longer an exclusive contract. He's, you know, signing for everybody now. Wow. Yeah, I'd love to know the details of what he charged top to be top to be exclusive. You know, remember how Ken Griffey Jr. was exclusive with like Upper Deck for a long time. You know, they got paid a fortune for that type of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, but the interesting thing with kind of going back to the the variety, so. Again, Michael, I know there's at least seven backs for the 36. At least seven, ones I've been, seven backs. Um, and then I just picked up for the the 35, four and one. There's two versions with Hank on the front and two with him on the back. So I just picked up the, the second back version, which is really hard. Like with the Joe Crone in front and Hank on the back. It's, oh, yeah. I didn't know that one existed. Uh, did you know that, Brian? No, I, I didn't know. Dodgers. Yeah, I, I didn't know it existed before Sean found it. Yeah, I thought it was just the Dodgers card that he's on the back of. I had yeah. no idea. Oh wow, look, there's actually people on here with us. Look at this. There's Pino, oh, Brown, Bowman, Sweet. Yeah, um, we got some, some people in the chat. But. Um, yeah, thanks again, though, Phil, for the trade. I, I, I really appreciate it, Sean. And uh, like I said, I, I hope we can do more of these, Brian. And we've done some trades over the years. Uh, it's just it's just hard to find people the, you know, willing to do it. Or I've had a couple in the years that, that like you said, they say, here's what it's selling for. And you know, it's like the stock market. Now that you're a dealer, Brian, you must... It's like day trading, isn't it? I mean, cards just fluctuate every day anymore, don't they? Yeah, I mean, you have to pay attention to stuff. I was telling you, you know, before we went live that I don't do many trades anymore with inventory. I only really trade if it's um, something I'm not into for as much as I'm getting back. Um, but I'm finding a lot of people, like in this time frame, are wanting to trade, and I just think they're they don't have as much cash to spend on cards as they do at other points in the year. Like I'll put something up for sale on Facebook, and people immediately ask me if I can trade something more now than I ever have. So I think there's some, definitely something to that specifically. But I do like trading, but sometimes I miss what I trade away. <laughs> you do get attached. I mean, I you do. have the green card signed rookie, and you still are sad because you lost the <laughs> signed index card or the signed card with the fancy uh, numbers and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, I I do miss that, but I know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> Probably the best trade ever made, right there. I would have to guess. Yeah, I mean, I would I would make that trade again. Yeah, Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I would make the trade again, but it was um, it was hard to let that go. It was, it was just so cool and so unique. I, I don't think I'll ever see something like that. That's one thing I love from cards like that, probably from the 40s, 50s, 60s. And the collectors put a lot of love into getting those cards signed. It wasn't just here signed this usually. It was like, you know, they put pictures on the cards, and then they put stats on the cards, and 
it was really something special. This and some of them look professional. You see, on it's amazing, and uh, yeah, it, it was a different era for sure. Getting autographs back then. Um, there, there, there um, were some um, signed Babe Ruth Gowdies that auctioned, um, not with Uncle Jimmy, but a couple of like her heritage auctions ago, or in some large auction house. And someone had oh, also like Lou Gehrig was in there, and someone had like drawn with like crayon kind of like <laughs> like it was like across the card like that to like indicate where he wanted Babe Ruth or wanted Lou Gehrig to sign the card which I thought is genius like because you know they can sign it like here they can sign it on the bottom but he wanted it like he wanted it there um which I thought was incredibly smart <laughs> I love yeah. I love that yeah, since you mentioned it, that, that, that Uncle Jimmy collection was insane. Yes, it was. Or like that batter up I traded you, like with the number on the back of it, someone. I mean, that was somebody's little catalog numbers. He was, I don't know how he filed them. I'm sure that stamp had a special meaning to him, though. And you've had some hand cards, Brian, has had dates stamped on them. We don't know if that was dates they got the card or, or what it was. But uh, yeah. it's just amazing. Uh, what yeah. was that one that had a date stamped on it before it was issued? I think was it was that a better up or? No, that that's a thirty four Gaudi that I have. Um, but I think we kind of figured out that I think someone like didn't roll the year forward, like it was still stuck on nineteen thirty three, so thirty four. Uh -huh. um, so he probably but didn't stamp the way it out, but he didn't throw it out. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. But we've also seen stamped um, 1934 batter ups. We've seen them stamped on the back. Yeah, common. Yeah, very common. And also, but also, I think more so than cards, it's kind of the fun part with some of the postcards too. Um, oh yeah. Because you know, yeah, you can have the blank postcard, which is nice. But you know, having that, that date stamp on it, um, and especially the notes that you can have on there. I mean, was I, I have so I have two pictures from thirty five or two postcards from thirty five. One I think is two days before the World Series ended. Um, so someone writing about being at the World Series, um, and that was on a AL Champs uh, uh, Tigers postcard. And then the other one is postmarked of. I think a day after the World Series ended with someone saying this is these are the guys that beat the Cubs. <laughs> it was again, it was the Tigers team goal. Yeah. So having kind of those little things um, in the postcards especially is is very really interesting. Are these thirty five World Series time? Thirty five. Yeah. This is interesting because Hank got hurt in the second game and missed the rest of the series. So the fact that he was still dealing with mail and such, I guess because he couldn't play, he had some time to kill while the games. Well, these weren't these weren't from Hank. These were just random people that that sent oh, them okay. out. Yeah, um, like send it's, them to still, it's still fascinating to read, you know, what people are writing on those postcards. Um, I got them because it's you know it's still a Hank card because it's the team photo, but. Um, but yeah, really just fascinating. And they can get kind of pricey too. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, those Greenfield postcards, I mean, it's amazing to me how many you see. I mean, obviously people went, that must have been a very popular place in Detroit. I would guess close to the stadium and a lot of people went there and ate and because a lot of those postcards were sent out. Uh, more so than anything else you see in Detroit. I don't know if I've ever seen anything besides a Greenfield postcard from Detroit during that time period. Well, maybe not during that time period, um, but I have that London chop house with Greenberg and DiMaggio at the sitting yeah. at the table. Have you guys yeah. seen that? I've seen that. Is that like 45? Or? Yeah, let me see if I can quickly dig it out. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. That's the only one I've ever seen of that. John, do you prefer postcards that have that were sent and dated over blank postcards? 
I think it depends. I mean, I want to see what the content is on the if if somebody's written on, I want to see what the content is. Um, so if someone, you know, World Series is interesting because you have someone that's actually there, and then someone writing about you know who beat their Cubs essentially, you know, <laughs> in the after fact after afterwards. So that, it it adds another dimension in the right situations when you buy the postcard. I agree. So here's the London Chop House. I just love like what they say. They bat the breeze instead of the ball. Yeah. This is postmarked um, June 5th, 1947. So shortly after Hank retired, but Joe is uh, still in the league. Well, it's not surprising because Hank was living in, in Manhattan. So. Yeah, but this is in Detroit. Oh, that's a true. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So the steakhouse was in Detroit. Okay. Sent to someone in Joplin. What is that? Montana? Missouri? Mon it, that, that's Montana, right? I know. Missouri. Missouri. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, Hank was friends with DiMaggio for a long time. They were. I've seen a lot of pictures of them together over the years and such. I like I the funky any. ties. Hank always had funky ties back in the forties. He was really well dressed. Yes, he was a sharp dressed man back then. Well, all he had to do was go down to Kimball's and get anything he wanted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> For those of you unfamiliar, he married Carol Gimble, the daughter of the founder of Gimble's Department Store in New York. Are they still around, or I since they've been gone a while? I think, they, I think they're gone. Yeah, that's a good but, point, though. He didn't have to buy anything off the rack, that's for sure. No. But it's interesting, I have, like, I have a signed menu from some New York restaurant. Um, that someone obviously brought up to him and Eric signed it. Um, That's cool. And I actually don't have any photos of him with DiMaggio. I have some photos of him and Ted Williams, though. That's cool. Yeah. But DiMaggio, I've, Michael, got a couple, I've seen him at a couple of the old timers games. They always are next to each other. Yeah. And pictures. Uh, you remember that picture we saw, Brian, at the Nationals a couple of years ago? They were signed by both him and DiMaggio. That was amazing. It was huge. Um, it was huge. It was like twelve hundred bucks too. But it was. Uh, I've seen one on eBay. It pops up occasionally. They want like a thousand dollars for it. So I probably never own it, but it's pretty cool. That's Actually, a great postcard. You've never seen that postcard besides yours. That's for sure. I have a I have a newspaper insert where. Greenberg was being honored for going into the military it's from 1941 for going to the service. And then DiMaggio was getting an award, I think, for best player or whatever from whatever organization it was. So I do have one picture of the two together. Yeah, I have a photo of uh, the night before Hank uh, went, went to the military in the early 1941. DiMaggio, I think, threw a party for him, and he was there. Here's a picture of them together before he shipped out the next day, which is pretty cool. Uh, but they were good buddies. There's no doubt about that over the years. Michael, you know about um, – Michael, you have the Ruby Foos postcard, right? I have it. It's still with Manny. I, I sent him seven things, and uh, I, he's five of them are done now. But he's not sending anything until all seven of them get done. So I'm still waiting on the two autographs right now. I got the Ruby Foos. And I got another one, which would be interesting to Sean, I'm sure, because it's a mid-30s autograph he put on the back of a hotel postcard. And I looked up the hotel on uh, online, and it's the, it was Miami's only kosher hotel at the time in the mid-30s. Okay. So so and, cool. Uh, yeah, that's that's hard to believe in a, a kosher hotel, but I guess that was pretty common back then. I would guess, or at least more common, that's for sure. But it's signed on the back by Hank. So most of those postcards are coming back. 
it's just a matter of when you're I got the 36 there to be signed. I'm waiting on and the and the sample that signed sample I got. I'm still waiting on that one to come back to. That's been a long time. That's probably since since about June or July, I would say, since Manny got those. So obviously PSA DNA's taking their time too. Really Michael, did you know? Authentication, did you get the card and the auto graded or just like like how did you do that with the PSA? No, I just got the auto grade. I don't care about the card grade. Both cards are pretty one's horribly off center and one's pretty bad rough. So there's no sense in getting the I don't care about the card grade. I just want to get it the autograph authenticated to anything. Nice. Yeah. yeah. So uh, uh, pulling out the binder, and I have various things in here. Since we're talking about interesting uh, Greenberg autos, because I figured I think the menu is in here. It is. So that's the auto. Oops. And this is from. This will be the Concord. Yeah. Oh, it's a menu. That's the so menu. Cool. Oh. What year is it? Is it say? Um, I uh, actually the menu is dated. So June fourth, nineteen sixty-six. Interesting. That is cool. And it's I got JSA cert on it, which is nice. That is very cool. I love the so idea that someone walks up to you and says, you mind signing the autograph for me, Mr. Greenberg? And he just picks yeah. up the menu and just starts signing on top of it. Like, I, I love dated autos. I know you guys like those too. Um, but having those, you know exactly when it took place. Yeah. Uh, this is, I'm still trying to find more of these at, you know, a reasonable price, too. Oh, no contracts? Like, yeah. Old player contract. This is the only one I've ever been able to find at a reasonable price. Um, but it is signed by hand. What's the price, if you don't mind me asking? For this yeah. one, I paid, uh, I think, 125 That's very reasonable. For Ray Boone, who's an all-star catcher. Um, there's some that you know people are asking outrageous amounts of money for. But what's the um, one you're waiting for? I know you're waiting for one. I saw Rose and it, I missed Rose and it went out went at an auction. I missed it. And I saw it after the fact. So um, Ryan's looking for the Bob Feller one. I know that's the one he's waiting. <laughs> you can have Bob Feller. I I went. Uh, <laughs> Brian, you know he struck out Hank Greenberg once. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you have that sitting out. That's crazy. Of course I do. This is my favorite card in my collection. <laughs> there you go, Brian. That one, Sean. There you go. That's Signed cool. by Hank on the back. Did, wow. Did, did Bob inscribe it? I struck out Hank Greenberg on the front. <laughs> There's a baseball, Sean, floating around on eBay. It says, I struck out Hein Greenberg signed and Bob Feller. It's on the baseball. I someone bought it. I don't know. I've been thinking about buying it for you though. What would you do if that showed up in your mailbox when you... I, I would appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> it's hilarious. I mean, where did you come up with that inscription? Somebody had to ask him or what do you think that I mean, I love the history of items. I love history in general, but why would it, Bob Feller make that baseball? I, I'd love to, if I could ask him that question, that would be the one question I would ask him. Of course, he would say, what baseball? What are you talking about? Yeah, baseball? he would not know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's the one thing I want to know about your life, Bob Feller, is why did you write that baseball? <laughs> yeah. There you were. Um, well, I guess we ought to get back to uh, the Jewish players. Sean, who do you want to? We're going to try to focus one on each of our broadcasts. 
if we do any more broadcasts. <laughs> but, uh, if, go ahead and uh, who are you focusing on today, sir? So I'm going to focus on, so there's a, there's only a handful of players I try to focus on getting all of the available cards. Um, I have Kofax, which I'll focus on at different times. So I have a few things coming in. Um, Greenberg, obviously. Uh, Al Rosen, which I'll do another time. And kind of the forgotten one is uh, Morris Arnovich, who had a very short career. Um, and it's funny, I have, I'll start things off because I do have his yearbook or one of his yearbooks. Um, I just have to find the right page with a picture of him on it. Um, so this is, he was raised in Superior, Wisconsin. Um, obviously a Jewish player. And so far as we know, he's the only player to ever keep kosher his entire career. Um, so this is Superior, Wisconsin, the Echo from 1930. Um, and Morris Arnovich is right down here. Oops, right there. <laughs> now, the interesting thing I found with the yearbook, they even have a baseball team in high school. So oh. he played rec league um, and played uh, minor league ball after that. But, you know, it's not, he didn't have a high school development. And then this is the book that we referenced last program. Um, this is the Jewish baseball card book. And there's one page on Arnovich in here. So it was 1939 All-Star, one, one time All-Star with the Phillies. This is my local team, which is kind of a nice little perk for that. Um, so those are a couple items I have on, and then I'll go through some photos. The earliest photo I have is 1935. A little small photo of his. Wow. And then a nice Burke signed photo. No, oh, that's very nice. That's a beauty. Which that's really hard. His autos are tough to find because he died when he was uh, 58 years old. I'm sorry, 48 years old um, in 1959. So he wasn't around very long um, before he passed away. There, so I'm sliding into second. And then <clears throat> this is the young energetic outfielder, outfielder, outfielder for the Philadelphia Phillies. Little newspaper insert. Um, this is a piece that actually. Um, started a very large trade for me, or a very large purchase for me. This is the same guy that I bought a bunch of uh, Moberg autos from, a bunch of Hank autos from, um, and this was the piece that started it. Um, 1939 envelope um, of the Phillies with Arnovich at the bottom, right down here. Beautiful. So this was the one piece that then I asked when I purchased this, I said, do you have any either Arnovich, Moberg, Hank Greenberg items? And he actually messaged me, private messaged me, and we did a deal off of eBay uh, for that. There's Arnovich sliding into something. in 1939. This is an interesting one because this is taken at the All-Star Game, 1939. With can be um, and this is um, the interesting thing with this is even though he was the 39 All Star, he never set set foot on the field. Um, while the games were different those days, and generally the starters would stay in the entire game, um, he was still the leading hitter in the National League, and he decided not to play him. Now, one theory is that. Hardnett, especially given his 
um, visceral attacks against Greenberg in the 35 World Series, probably saw Arnovich and decided not to have a Jew play in the All-Star game. So can't confirm that, but that is one of the theories. Um, so this is an interesting photo, 1940. So during the off season, cutting wood, you know, cause that's the workout routine back in the day. <laughs> um, this is a 1940 team issue, Philadelphia Phillies. And this is the 1940 Philadelphia Phillies. Wow, you got a bunch of nice That's beautiful. Um, this is May of 1940. Then it got brushed back. This is the 1941 Wheaties panel. Oh, I love the Wheaties. And the last of the big pieces is a postcard. This is a brace postcard. No, it's a big the Giants. So that's the large items. Now, Arnovich, the only cards that are available for Arnovich are 39, 40, and 41. Um, so I'm just going to start from the beginning and we'll go from there. So 1940, play ball. Trying to get the glare. You have the two different backs here. You have the upper and lower case versions there. Um, and of course, I have these slabbed as well. This is the all uppercase in a six. And then the all uppercase in a seven. And then this is the lowercase in a five. So what's wow. oh, incredibly rare and actually something we mentioned earlier was the Uncle Jimmy collection. Um, fortunately, they misspelled his name when they listed it at uh, um, Wheatland listed the auction. So I actually have a signed 1939 Morris Arnovich. Yeah, that's beautiful. Wow. Is that too Jimmy? That's too Jimmy. That's so cool. Um, and that is actually the harder to find uh, lowercase pack. Um, so from there, then we go into the 1940 play ball. So two and a half, three and a half, three and a half. <laughs> and this one, I actually, Probstein had this available for sale. And actually, we kind of bartered, we went back and forth price wise. So I have, an, I have a signed 1940 play ball, Arnovich. Wow. That's, and that must be that. Oh, they don't, his auto, on-card autos do not come up often sure. at all. Um, and then we go into 1941. We have a two, a three, and actually a really good example of a three and a half. And then we have the 1941 double play, Arnovich and Carl Hubble, because he was with the uh, Giants by this time. Do that in a six. I actually have two sixes on this, which is really weird, but eh, that's what happens. Um, and then just a simple cut stig slab. That and then. Yeah. Couple of the harder ones to get. This is a 1940 team issue for the Cincinnati Reds. Arnovich. Is there anything on the back? Yep. It's got stats on the back. Interesting. And the toughest, this is the 41 draw that I have. The hardest one to get um, is 1941. Um, Gaudi. That's the greenback. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that before. You've seen it in the book. Yeah, in the book, it. yes. I've never seen one in each person that I know of. Yeah. So, and these are blank backs because these oh. were mail in redemption. Sorry. Um, 
so that is i have a few more autos kind of scattered about but that's um i think i have two more autos and larger slabs but that's the arnovich collection that's amazing in a nutshell amazing. but that again because was that part of scarcity due to the fact that didn't back in the day people didn't get cards signed because they thought that was destroying the card so to speak well you have you know if you look at you know the 30s and 40s is generally speaking kids that would go here can you sign my card or ball or whatever it may be at that time um once the kind of quote-unquote collector um aspect entered into it um yeah it was you were destroying the card if you had the player sign it um yeah and this was you know basically 70s 80s 90s you know you did not want a player to sign so if you look at you know all the lost opportunities of for example being you know ted williams joe dimaggio mickey mantle like if there wasn't that stigma there'd be a lot more on card playing days cards available with their signatures on them yeah, i've seen two hank rookie cards signed that were period signatures that's the only two i've ever seen is that all you've seen too brian i know you've seen both of them yeah as as long as far as i can remember i think the first one went for five Three thousand, the second one, the five thousand, and the second one went something crazy, didn't it? Like ten thousand or something like that. Twelve. Yeah. It was in oh. Uncle Jimmy's collection. Yeah. yeah it was the same auction I got this one in. And the first one we saw a couple years before that one it was went for like five, I think, and we thought that was crazy back then. Who knows? Who did we know? There are monsters yeah. in the cupboard. But some of the obscure players. You know, are incredibly difficult to to get um depending on how long they were around um again arnovich was only you know 48 when he passed of a heart attack and and plus on top of that in the off season he wasn't living in a large metropolis um he played for you know big markets you know philly uh new york and then he played for cincinnati but in the off season he was in superior wisconsin and that's where he retired to you don't have you know a huge group of people trying to get things signed by him either so that's kind of another aspect of yeah. kind of rarity and anybody listening people don't know that the the salaries people make today are around you know 30 40 million dollars a year um back in the 30s like charlie Geringer, all-star second baseman maybe one of the best probably top five second baseman ever he actually worked in a department store in the off season selling suits because yeah. they didn't make that kind of money back then. A lot of them did, had to have second jobs in the off season to make a living. And I'm sure anybody watching this that would think about what's going on today. I mean, I guess your the rookie salary is probably what a couple million a year, I would guess. A million. And it's it's like around five hundred thousand for uh, an entry level salary. But yeah. can you imagine someone like Charlie Garinger working in a department store in the 30s just to make ends meet when he wasn't playing ball in the game? And, I, uh, I would love to buy a suit from Charlie Garinger. <laughs> that would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? <laughs> it was probably it was just it was such a different world back then. You know, you know what? Hank didn't do that, but you know, Hank when he signed with the the Pirates, he was the first person ever to make a hundred thousand dollars a year in baseball. Yeah, that's how deal. good he was. I mean, people don't know him as well today, but at the time, he was the highest paid player in baseball for one year. Um, it's It just shows you, I mean, it's just a different world back then. People just don't realize how many things have changed over the years. Yeah, I saw that the basketball players, he's at, at, one guy's got $45 million a year, a Giannis guy or something. I mean, his, his salaries are crazy now. But back then, the owners kept most of everything for it. They didn't share it with the players. So it was a different world. That was a great recap, though, Sean. I enjoyed every bit of that. I had no idea. It's so fun to see all that and together to tell a story and to just admire how much 
Because I know how tough those autographs are to get. That's impressive you got that many. Well, it's fun. Like I said, I, 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 no, go on. I, I think it's fun because I uh, ideally what I like to try and get is is have at least one auto of every Jewish play. At least within reason. Because some of these guys are just unobtainable. But um, And if I can, if the opportunity comes about then get you know an on card um auto um so again like one of the one of the ones i was really happy to get was um the 33 andy cohen you know yeah. it's beat up but i have an on card auto you know on a 33 gaudy of andy cohen like it's for the jewish collecting side of it it's one of kind of the highlighted cards if you will um that people always go for yeah i've always i've always just wanted to get one jewish actually if they had a card issued i'd like to get one of every player that i can and i use the 2003 uh, jml set to, to compensate for all the ones that never had cards issued and i'd like to get an autograph for each but i never focused on on card autos i wish i had and of course, now SGC won't grade them anyway, so it doesn't matter as far as my registry set goes. But um, yeah, I'd love the on card ones. They're, they're just beautiful. But even um, even that's getting hard because as we've, as the three of us have seen, focusing on the um, Hank cards, the on card stuff, like we're seeing cards that are going for you know thousand, two thousand dollars. Um, and every once in a while, you'll get, you know, the abnormality where to go below that. But, you know, and I'm seeing, you know, with like Koufax, seeing modern signatures. So Sharpie signatures on vintage cards going for a thousand plus dollars. It's absolutely insane. Um, some of the stuff. Uh, I don't know. How long is, this going, is it going to last? Is this going to work? Is it going to last post COVID? I don't know. Uh, well, Brian, you probably have some thoughts about that since you're dealing now. What do you think about the market and where it's heading? Um, I, th I think something monumental needs to happen to really cause a correction. Um, there's just a lot of money in the hobby right now, like more, more than we know. Um, and I don't think that like getting a vaccine to coronavirus is really gonna stop the momentum and the train from like full steam ahead. There's just so much money being exchanged. It's it's it, it's it's pretty wild. Um, but one question I actually have for Sean yeah. is do you know or is there correspondence of greenberg with arnovich andy cohen al rosen like in those parts of their careers like did they communicate were they friendly how do you know of their relationship with any well i mean i haven't seen any i do have i don't have a photo but i actually have a slide of um, Greenberg and Rosen, because Greenberg being the GM for the Indians during Rosen's career, uh, and he only played with the Indians, um, there's that aspect of it. Um, I haven't, I'm sure there's, there had to have been at least some correspondence, but I haven't seen much um, personally, um, nor have I read much. I mean, it, it's, it, it's an interesting view and you can find a lot about of players talking about other players but not necessarily them coming together and having documented conversations yeah that's true it would have been interesting and i would think that they would be friendly only because of like hank's disposition and his willingness to kind of help others that came after him um, you know, of the Robinson and the Kiners, um, and, you know, et cetera. And I just think that like, if they had, if he had a bond with those players over similar adversity or just 
mentorship that he would have a something he would have something similar with someone who shared the same faith well i, I also find what i would really kind of love to hear about is so you have hank who gave a certain amount of slack to you know uh any semitic remarks but would also stand up and he was a big guy he did not want to mess with him um and he would go and he would uh take a piece out of you if he needed to um moving forward after his playing days you have al rosen who had a rule you have i'll give you two free shots after that i'm gonna punch you in the face um <laughs> and he was he was a golden glove he was he went when he was in florida military institute he was there on a boxing scholarship he was not a guy you wanted to mess with wow um, he broke his nose, I think, 13 times. What? And I have I have uh, photos, which in another conversation, I have a whole binder of, of Rosen photos of him being taken out of games because he broke his nose for, you know, the 13th time. Um, <laughs> in addition to, you know, breaking his hands, breaking, you know, his fingers, wow. you know. <laughs> It, it, he was he was one of those guys that he had I think a, a more intense mentality, um, much more direct about it. Um, I think there was a certain amount of diplomacy that Hank had to play, especially being in Detroit um, and in that environment where the odds are against you more so than Cleveland, um, especially given those time periods. Um, but I think you know there are similarities in their mindset. So I would love to see kind of if the, if the two of them had conversations along those lines. It'd be interesting. I've never read anything directly about that, yeah. but I'm sure it'd be a very personal issue to them that they wouldn't be talking about in public, I would think. Uh, I mean, Hank Probably. endured so much. I mean, they've cleared, they cleared the bench one time that they said they were going to, if they kept throwing those in, you know, the, anti-semitic comments at him he went into an opposing dugout one time with his baseball bat calling out all the guys that were throwing those um, slurs at him uh he would fight i remember i read a story about on a team bus uh, when back when he was in uh minor leagues uh, someone gave him a lot of guff and called him goldberg instead of greenberg and uh, he got up to confront the guy and the guy kind of i don't know if they made it into a funny story intentionally or they said he said yeah i'm the guy you got a problem with me and he said no i got a problem with goldberg i ain't got any problem with the guy named Greenberg right now. Uh, but uh you know hank was, uh, the, the, the all-star game photos my i love that picture because hank looks like he's about a foot and a half taller than gary mm -hmm. and all the guys in, the, in that picture and you know, I, I think of Aaron Judge a lot today when I when I look at him, I think of how by today's standards, how he towers over and these guys are big nowadays, a lot of them. Uh, that's how Hank was back then and he was like was six three, six four. Yeah. Big stocky guy and uh, he just towered over these guys and it's hard to imagine they would say too much to him because you know, I wouldn't want to pick a fight with him, that's for sure. Yeah. His personality, like you said, he was he I'm sure it made him upset, but you know, early in his career, he said that I don't, I want to be known as a great baseball player, not a great Jewish baseball player. I want to be known as a great player. And yeah. then later on in life, he recognized the importance of his Jewish heritage and he is proud to be a great Jewish baseball player, but uh, it's just a, a different perspective over time. And, you know, you're trying to prove yourself and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and I can't imagine, you know, then he saw Robinson going through that, and they had that discussion at first base that time. And, of course, Jackie walked away very impressed with him, which I'm sure a lot of people were. And, you know, he was a very he – he, he did his uh, general managing. I, I'm sure he would have had a relationship with a lot of the Jewish players, I would think, that at least he came in contact with. Because he, I'm sure he would have prepared them a little bit for what they were going to get into. And then, you know, when things calmed down later in the 40s and 50s, or 50s and 60s, I should say, 
Because I don't think Kovacs went through nearly that as much of that type of, uh, of, of issue. No, Kovacs got more uh, more guff because he was a bonus baby. He was what? He was a bonus baby. So he a never. Okay. So they gave him a bunch of money up front, so he never played the minors, and they had to carry him on the roster. That's where he caught a lot of, of his uh, uh, a lot of huh. snipe remarks and everything. Were because of that. Michael, this is the picture you were talking about. Yeah, yeah I didn't know you got that. Where did you get that? I've had this for a long time. I don't remember that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's a great. Is that the Galasso card? I think. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, the Mountain Galasso. You know, y'all are young. I, I I grew up in the. I was born in '65 and grew up in the '70s. And there, were, back then, if you didn't have a hometown baseball card shop, buying cards was next to impossible. People used to eBay now. Uh, there was Renato Galasso had a catalog that he put out all the time, and Larry Fritz. I don't know if y'all have ever heard of them. He's out of, I think, Wisconsin. And they would put out catalogs, and I used to order cards through them. Like, they put out a catalog every three months or something like that. But I had one baseball card shop I could get to in Louisville, and it was hard to get baseball cards back in those days, except for new issues. Like, if all everybody sold baseball. You went to the drugstore, grocery stores, everybody sold the new top stars. But get anything vintage was really a job back then. So that was one of the many reissues they put out. And it's cool you got that. That's a great card, Brian. I didn't I forgot all about that. I'm sure you showed it to me at one time, but that's awesome right there. I love it. Yeah, I mean I think let me I can consult my spreadsheet, but I, I don't think I paid more than fifty dollars for it. That's amazing. <laughs> Yeah, some of the stuff it's you can good. find, some of the modern stuff you can find actually pretty reasonable still. Um, it's funny because I know, Michael, you and I were talking about never seeing Hank, a picture of Hank, um, of him smiling in a Pittsburgh uniform. Yeah, and, very few. You found and, I, <laughs> and it's funny, I sent you um, the um, picture of him and Happy Chandler. Or he's actually smiling. I completely forgot I had a full signature Chandler and Greenberg uh, poster. Really? That's, you guys on you? Uh, I'll have to see if I can pull it out. That's cool. Like Michael, I paid twenty five dollars for this card. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll give you twenty six. <laughs> okay, that's fair. <laughs> no, I don't, well, maybe it's a zero after it, it's fair, but that's fair. <laughs> Surprisingly, that's I was able to find card. it. I, really like I forgot all about you having the card. That's a gorgeous piece. There you go. You got signed by both of them. Yeah. I think he became governor of Kentucky at one point, if I remember correctly. Really? Not, not Hank. <laughs> <Happy Hank. laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Yeah, he was actually governor of Kentucky at one time. I'm not sure how he was related to the Pirates. But I've got two or three pictures of Hank. You know, I think he was just shocked. That, I mean, he learned, like, on the radio that he'd been traded to the Pirates. And he still hit 25 home runs that year. I just wonder if he would have been with the Tigers if he would have played two or three more years, even after that. Um his average did dip like in the 270s, I think, that year. But I really think he was kind of uh, – he really didn't want to play for the Pirates that year, and he did. They gave him a big contract, and they created, what, Greenberg Gardens out in left field and all that. And um, But I think he really lost his will to play after that season with the Pirates. I thought he was – they gave him that man, a job with Cleveland, and uh, I think he was just ready to move on at that point. Kind of a shame. I wonder if he was with the Tigers if he would have lasted maybe to maybe 1948, 49, maybe or so. I think I mean, there's a possibility. I mean, 46, he led the, the league again in home runs. So, I mean, 
There's no reason he couldn't play a couple more years now. He's only, what, 36, I think, when he retired? Or? 38. 36 38? or 38. 36, about one of them. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just a matter of somebody that didn't, you know, kind of lost their fire to play at that point, I really believe. But um, I'm sure the Pirates promoted him off a of big because that's why they got him was just to get fans in the stands. And I'm sure there's a lot of that he didn't enjoy either. You know, taking pictures like Happy Chan. He did a lot of promotional stuff, I'm sure, for the Pirates. And that probably got on his nerves too, I would think, after a while. But, uh, oh, I was going to do one player too. John, I'm going to do a very quick one. This is a short one. Um, my player is Jesse Baker, which nobody's ever heard of because he only appeared in one game as a player. Um, this is a picture. This is he's out of the Jewish major league star. It's a poor photo because there's probably none that really exists of him that most people know of. He's born Michael Myron Silverman, and at some point he changed his name to Jesse Baker. He's not he's called Peeweed or Tiny because he was only five foot four. He's a five foot four shortstop from Cleveland, and he's playing for the Richmond Colts. And the minor leagues, and the Senators saw he was doing pretty well and brought him up to the major leagues. And he, his first game, I think it was September 14, 1919, it was his only game. Uh, he played shortstop. Uh, the Tigers were in town. Uh, the Tigers had scored five runs in the first inning. Uh, he was the eighth in the lineup in the bottom of the first. He didn't get to bat because they didn't get to the eighth spot. And he went back on the field in the second inning. And uh, the first two batters were retired. The third batter up was a guy named Ty Cobb. Some people might have heard. And uh, he got a single to get on first. He saw this little, the guy playing sec, uh, shortstop. And, you know, he's five foot four. I'm sure not very physically imposing, at least on his he's guys. He took off for second to steal the base and apparently Ty Cobb, I've heard a lot of bad stories about him. Another one I know now is that when he would slide in bases to steal, he was a guy that went in cleat, cleats up. He did not keep his leg down. He'd keep it up yep. about waist level so that if he could hit your arm, he would knock the ball out of the glove. Again, nothing that they would definitely allow anymore in a long time. But uh, Baker took the throw, and uh, he did. He actually was there waiting for Cobb, from what I've read. But Cobb cleated him in the forearm and knocked the ball out of his hand. And unfortunately, uh, he got injured enough to where he missed a little time. And uh, the Senators thought with his small – uh, frame and stuff. He just went to hold up to major league, so they sent him back to Richmond, and uh, he never got back to the major league. So he's a Jewish major leaguer who only appeared in one game, never got any bat, but he did get cleated by Ty Cobb. Is uh, the story on him? Uh, interesting is he went to play a few more years in minor league ball, but he never got back to the majors. But he did end up going to Hollywood at some point, and he was actually a stunt double for James Cagney in the movies back then, which is kind of crazy. And he became a boxing promoter and manager too. But such a shame that a guy worked so hard for years to get to the major leagues, and uh, Ty Cobb ended it by uh, cleaning him in the forearm. So uh, one of the few Jewish major leaguers that didn't get to play much, but uh, a great story, I think, and uh, just a shame he didn't get to compete at a longer level at that point. What happened to Sean? Sean's battery died. Oh, no. Well, that is a great story, though. Yeah, it is. It's, I didn't know that about Ty Cobb, and uh, I've heard some bad things, and that's another one to add to the list. Though I, I don't know. Maybe that was pretty common back then to, when you slid into bases to go uh, cleats high to try to take somebody out or – dislodge the ball from the glove, but it shows you how much difference you know, it was a different world back then playing baseball, that's for sure. 
Yeah, think that about all the, all the careers that uh, weren't like that didn't pan out because of an injury like that. Yeah, well, how many did cop calls over the year? I mean, he's a prolific base dealer, so I'm sure it's happened many a time. Um, so just kind of interesting. This this erupting world back, but now they can't even. You know, the catchers are protected now. You can't even see it. It's just like a different after Buster Posey got injured and such. It's a, just a different world now. There he yeah. is. He's back. Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Now. I had my, my, my computer die, so went on my phone. It's not how good the audio is. You're fine. Yeah, you should. Very good. Very good. So, but Sean, you missed a great. A great story, Michael told. I mean, you, you'll be able to see it when you watch the uh, uh, the the stream again after it's published. Yeah, yeah if you do some more of these, hopefully, I will try to find some more obscure JML players and uh, tell some little stories about them like that, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, it's just kind of sad. But you know, those things happen, especially back then. No telling, like you said, how many careers got shortened over stuff like that. But uh, very nice. It's also, it's also interesting uh, the impact that World War II had on a lot of Jewish players, too. Oh, God. Yeah. You know, one thing I didn't mention with Arnovich was um, so he was an all star in 39, played for the Reds in 40, uh, the Giants a little bit in 41, and then went into the service. And he didn't come back, I think, until 45. Um, and he just was not the same person. He couldn't. He couldn't do the Hank Greenberg and just go out and start hammering home runs again. Um, his career was essentially over at that point. Um, yeah. Al Rosen's another guy that graduated in '41, went to the service first, and then went into the major leagues. Um, so there's a whole lot of different guys um, that were impacted in various ways. And actually, some of those Jewish players that yeah, only played one game were because they were replacement players uh, during right. World War II. Right. Well, that, they all lost all their jobs when their players got back. Of course, Hank said himself before he came back that he thought his career was over. He didn't think he'd ever play ball again because he had no idea what kind of uh, – if he still had his – you know, he could condition himself, but he didn't know if he still had the eye and that sort of thing to, to bat again. And of course, like I said earlier, he in forty he came back. I mean, what a comeback! He comes back, hits a home run his first game on July first, leads them to the World Series with a grand slam home run against the Browns on the last day of the season. Uh, and he has a terrific two run home run, you know, World Series. Uh, if they would have had MVPs of the World Series back then, he would have won it. Um, and in 46, he leads the league in home runs again. And it's unbelievable he came back at that level and, and assumed that almost immediately after, what, four years yep. of being gone, four and a half years. Uh, it's just crazy when you think about that. And like you said, so many players, probably most of them never got their chance again. Yep. Uh, and the ones that did, I'm sure very few of them got back to the same level they were. That's a long time. Uh, and Michael, don't you have the program from that first series? Yes, I've got the program from his first game back in 45 when he hit the home run. I actually got a photo of him hitting home plate, coming across home plate during that game. And I got the program from the Grand Slam when he hit, he hit against the Browns to clinch the trip to the World Series or to the playoffs that year. Um, so, yeah, I, I love that kind of stuff. It's, that's what, you know, the cards, you know, I love I like photos too. That's why I think the three of us collect the same guy, but we collect them in so many different ways. It's just, and all you guys, anybody out there listening that collects players, there's so many things. You, know, you can collect cards. That's wonderful. But you know, like for me and Sean, press photos are fan. I just love photos. I think, yes, the things like that, they tell a story. They're just awesome. Uh, 
Of course, Brian has multiple crazy multiples of, I mean, just amazing tank stars. It's, it's just fantastic collection. I love when you get new diamond stars and stuff like that. It's just amazing. How many are you up to now? 13. 13. <laughs> that, that doesn't even make sense to me when you say that. It's crazy. I have to get to 18. That is crazy. Yeah, I only and have six or seven. The photos, programs, ticket stubs. Um, there's so many ways to collect your player. It's just, it's just uh, be creative with what you're doing because uh, there's just so many ways to approach it. You can collect a player dozens of ways. It's just whatever makes you happy doing it. Like you say, Sean, at the end of your videos, it's, you make, don't worry about what anybody else is doing. Just whatever you enjoy, do it. Um, it, you know, to me, I'm a completist, so I do like having a checklist of cards so I know what to go after. But on the other hand, when you talk about photos or tickets, that I means there's just there's only a limited number out there. I mean, some things are going to pay to you more than other things. But go get the things you like. It, it complements your collection so much. Like when you're showing an Arnabush, you're showing photos and signed cards. I mean, there's so many ways to go with this thing. It's, that's what makes it fun. And you see, you have such a, I didn't know you had such a large collection. I've probably seen most of those pieces one at a time. Yep. But when you throw it all together like that, it's just like, wow, that's just amazing. That's beautiful. The yearbooks, I mean, uh, and you got a lot more than just that one. That we'll, I'm sure you'll be sharing with us in the future. Uh, I just love that kind of stuff. We gotta get you that Hank yearbook. Though. That's what you need, man. That's the one I need because I have, I have Arnovich, I have Kofax, I have Moberg, um, I have Al Rosen, and I'm just missing uh, Hank. <laughs> well, I have no doubt it should be in your future at one time, hopefully one way or another, sir. I don't know. There's, there's one that's floating out there on eBay, but they're asking some astronauts. Yeah, that's in the eBay museum because <laughs> yeah. that's been there since we've been collecting, I think. I think it's what, $1,000? Yeah. I mean, it's been sitting there for like, I know, like 12 years at $1,000. Brian's probably seen it before that. I, you just wonder what some people are thinking that sell on eBay. It's like, they just throw a big number out there, and they just don't change anything. It just sits there and just relisted over and over and over again. Well, the interesting that's, thing that's their prerogative, you know. Maybe that's their uh, registry set. They just stick it on eBay, and uh, they'll sit there forever. But everybody gets to see they got it, type thing. I don't know. Well, the interesting thing with yearbooks is if you can, some of the more obscure players, you know, you can research and you can find their yearbooks for like twenty five dollars. Or less. Um, that's crazy. I know, like, that's what happened with Rosen. And Rosen is all over um, the yearbook. Like, every yeah. athletic team, every club, you know, it's a senior yearbook. And I picked up for, like, $20 because I knew where he graduated and what year. Um, and the seller had no idea. It's not a huge, you know, dollar figure, but it's still, you know, an interesting item to have. Um, but yeah, sometimes you just oh, have to yeah. research and get lucky. Oh, yeah, it complements your collection so much, so much. Yeah. That's really cool. All right, Jeff, Brian, what else is on the agenda? I got nothing else. <laughs> I just love talking about it. You know, I was looking at your when you're showing your cards. It, Brian, do you know the 41 or the 40 play balls are a lot harder to find in high grade than the 39 and the 41s? Do you have any theory on that? I don't. Um, no, I don't have anything. I mean, you saw I took a picture of my of my stuff when I got my SGC order back. I don't have anything higher than a five and a half, and that's. Mm -hmm. That's abnormal for a card that is like a more common card. I don't know if I've ever seen it higher, like a seven or eight in that card. Have you? I yeah, I, I was trying to win the SBC eight. Uh, it was up for auction. A couple, like 
18 months ago, maybe? I don't even remember that. What did it go for? Like 1100 I think. Was it really? Wow. It was a pop, I think it was a pop one or a pop two with like none higher. It's a very, very low pop card. Oh, you- there's, there's a six for you. Very nice. Yeah, I've got yeah. a six myself. That's what I got. I've, I I've owned PSA sixes, but I didn't, I like, didn't like the way they looked. You know, I either sold them or crossed, or tried to cross them and they came back trimmed or something. I've just had bad luck with that card. I was also thinking that the 40, it seems like they used, for lack of a better term, a flakier paper. Um, mm-hmm. Like there's a higher wood pulp content in there. Yeah. So I it's, think so. it's very, very brittle compared to the 39, compared to the 41. Um, I think it's a much more brittle uh, cardstock that they used. Yeah, I don't know if the paper's supposed to be that brown. It seems. I don't know if that's, uh, you know, like a toning of the paper or if that's the way it is. If it is, it's this unusual cardboard stock they use for. There's a there's a variance. Some some of them are are more black and white. Some of them are more brown. Um, I also think the fact that they designed them with the narrow borders is really great because even if they're off center a little bit, like it can. It can be like qualified as like a mid-cut card. Um, like you always see the 34 Gaudi off center. Like to find a 34 Greenberg centered is really really hard. No. Um, they're always they're always off center. So even even that, and if, even if you compare the 33 Gaudi, the borders are very narrow. Um, even if the card's off center a little bit, it makes a huge difference because it's not like you have a wide border and a lot of variance. Right. Um, I'm trying to like find an example of something that I just like have at my desk, but I don't have I don't have any modern or vintage on my desk. It's all modern. Yeah, I think so. Too. Well, it's it's just you know <laughs> all, all the all. Is tucked away, but if you look at the forty uh, play ball, it's the toning of the card is very much like a newspaper of that time. Yeah, I, much, yeah much, exactly. Which exactly. is a much cheaper yeah. grade of paper of cardstock and everything. So I think that's again that's and and the issues with that card are very similar to like a newspaper, where you got that little chipping on the edge. You have. You know that you know that layer that comes off. I think that's the biggest issue that you're going to have with those, and that's why they're so hard. That's a good point. I think you're right on it. Yeah, that is for sure. I, I just like to see one or get one eventually. I'd like to get slight upgrade on that one. Um, but now the prices are getting so crazy; it's just hard to. I mean. Getting anything over a set, I mean, a seven, I think about in my lot, Terry, it's about as high as I can go for a lot of these. Maybe a six in some issues. Uh, it's just getting too price prohibitive now to get that high, high grade stuff. I love watching Heritage when they, they get the, some of the most amazing stuff on a consistent ba- basis that I've seen. I mean, this year's major auction houses, I haven't seen a whole lot. You know, as far as individual hand cards and these things, and of course they always they always put them in sets now. They don't, they don't break up the sets anymore. I'll tell you, this. yeah, because if you look at so if you look at the forty one. Yeah, speaking of sevens being the max out, <laughs> like it's the same. We know it's the same image. But look at the toning on the stock itself. It's just completely different. Yeah. Right. They changed the actual card stock. They kept the image. They changed the card stock. So. It makes sense. I'm sure they're trying to save money. It would probably be at that time. Um, yeah. Do you, I need to take a look at the, do you like the blend? and right? see if- I was gonna say, do you like the 
39 design or 40 better? Do you like the name at the bottom with the little catcher's mask and all that kind of stuff? Or do you like the plain, clean front of the 39? I'm a big 39 fan. I love 39. Yeah, I think 40, is, 40 play ball is not my favorite issue. Yeah. I really like 39 a lot. I like the 36. I just like the how the format is. I That's like not an option. <laughs> but. 36 was not an option. It was not on the multiple choice quiz. Well, I'm throwing them in there. <laughs> have you found how many like variation that. backs, not Hank, but just in general, <coughs> excuse me, how many variation backs you've seen on cards just flipping through them and such? I don't, I, I don't flip through a lot, so I don't know. Hmm. I just know, I know for Hank, I've gotten seven different backs. I just wonder how many total different backs they issue. I mean, you'd have to look at a lot of non-Hanks to try to put that together. But that'd be interesting to see. I can't imagine. It'd be hard to imagine they went a whole lot farther than that. I guess they could, but. Well, think about it, Michael. Like, the set, the set is not that big. I think it's only a 25-card set. And, yeah. and, and, the, and the backs correlated to a game. And so I'm sure there are certain players with certain back variations that would not be existent on other players. Yeah. To try to one have people complete the set and two be able to play the game. So I think there's like a, I, I think I think there are more than seven because in order for the game to be played properly, it, there there would have to be. Yeah, and obviously that's why you don't see too many high grade ones either because they were played with, they did play the game and such. Yeah. yeah, I think mine tops out as a six for any of them. Yeah, that's probably pretty high. I mean, I, that's probably tough. I don't know. I haven't looked at the pop reports on that one. Close. Um, there couldn't be too many above a six, I would think. But there are there are backs that are just are just. I've only been able to find one. Just one example. Period. Um, unfortunately, I was in a position I could get it because. They, it's funny, they're all priced the same, um, uh, even you know, regardless of how rare the back is. Hmm. What's yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if there's like much research, at least not that I've read, on on back variations um, in 36 Gaudi. What's the rarest back you've seen, Sean? Or have you noticed one that seems to be harder to find? Um, there's a few different ones. I'm trying to pull them out since I have my Hanks with me now. Um, I've, I've purchased a few raw. Um, but the foul double back is the easiest one to find. Um, foul. That's, the, that's the most common. A foul double back. You'll find that all over the place. Um, you know, the foul, there's the foul tip back, foul tip strike back. That's difficult to find. Um, and then there's a hit by pitch back. I don't even have one at slab. I have two raw versions. Um, and then there's the strike wild pitch. Those are all pretty much, I think those three were probably grouped into one um, sheet. Now, this strike, like, for good example, this strike wild pitch, this is the only one I found in the last six months on eBay, and oh. it's, a, it's a PSA 1. Huh. I like the one that says, like, miss being a peach of a hit or something like that. Yeah, there's a hit by pitch one, and out error, foul ball, foul tip, strike. And I try and get them in, you know, decent grades, but some of them I just can't find. So, but the nice thing with this set um, is that reprints are easy. If you see something that's foul double back, which is the most common, that's when you have to go, is it real versus is it a reprint? 
this is the most common one. This is the one they're going to reprint. They're not going to reprint any of these other backs because you just can't find them. Interesting. That's a good point, actually. That's very good. Uh, yeah, that would be the most common. And I, I've got some reprints. I'm going to go look at those now and see uh, if they got the same red back on all of them. I bet they do. That's interesting you decided to tackle that. I, I think that's, I'd love to see you write an article for SCD or something like that once you, uh, you could probably do it. I, they'd love something like that, I think. Yeah, I'm sure they would. Like that's a fun one. Again, the the 35 Gaudi four and one, finding both varieties that back, um, and that was a matter of figuring out which numbering the back of that particular panel on the back was, and then just doing, hey, is there any other cards that have that back? So we all knew the um, the Dodger back, which is so for those of you. No, it's familiar with it. So the Gaudi Ford one. That is the Dodger back. I'm using my phone, so it's a little harder to do all these things. Um, but that's a picture of Hank on the back. That's the common one. What's the other thing? The other one is a Joe Cronin. I know. I remember Joe Cronin being the one guy on there that I could remember. Um, so that's the guy I looked for. Um, but it's a one. So if you look at the side of that picture, it tells you the numbering for that panel on the picture. It's a 1G back. So finding the other card that had a 1G, and I thought there would be two simply because the front-facing Hank, you have 8F, the 8F back, and you have the 9F back. So there's only two variations for the front-facing Hank. So my thought process was there has to be two variations on the reverse. Huh. There should be two options of cards on the reverse. So that's, that's cool. kind of you led me down that. there. And then just doing a general search, I found one copy of the Cronin um, with the Hank back, but someone wanted it was a halfway decent grade, but they wanted like seven hundred dollars for the card. Like I'm not going to pay that. Seven hundred. Um, so it was just a matter of waiting until that card got listed by someone else, and then jumping on it for I think seventy bucks. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that. That's very cool. Very cool. But that's that's kind of the fun thing that at least I find is, you know, especially with vintage, um, you have all these, you know, people are more familiar with probably the 39, where you have the all upper case, the upper lower, and the sample back. You know, those are the three big, big ones for that. But there's so many different little nuances sometimes to different issues um, and the different variations that you can pick up. So if you really want to kind of expand beyond a, a, um, having examples of each year or each design if you really want to expand beyond that you can actually add different aspects to um, your particular collection yeah you know, i read an article i don't know if it was scd or what it was but it talked about the 40 play ball on the back of some of them it has a a line added to the bottom now brian i think you're you got, and, but then I read later on that it was like the first so many cards of the set. And it didn't include the Hank card, apparently. But uh, I was thinking, oh, no, there's another variation I might have to go <laughs> The point being... Yeah, that was, uh, huh? Yeah, that, I think that is the Superman back. Superman, uh, that, that that's, it. Yeah, that's it. Um, I think like in the semi-high and high numbers... What are like considered the, like those to be, but Hank being card number forty, like you'd never have that back. The other one is on forty-one play ball, um, in on the back, which would be the lower left corner. It would be copyright nineteen forty-one or just nineteen forty-one. I don't, I don't have one that's without the copyright, but check your forty-one play balls because that is another one that exists in some. For Hank, I believe so. Hmm. 
Because I was thinking, boy, if that Superman back exists, that's probably... Of course, a lot of people wouldn't even notice something like that when they list the cards, so it could go flying under the radar type thing. There you go. Thank you for noticing that, Brian, because I have both backs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, no, I got to buy another one. <laughs> so. We're yeah, at, update the master list, man. Yeah, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be on the bottom left. So you have copyright 1941. Yep. Hank is relentless. And then you have lower grade, but. There's a three, and it simply has copyright. Is the font is, is the font and words and everything look the same? Everything else, it's funny. As we were talking, um, the copyright without 1941, you can tell the difference when you really pick them up and look at them. It's a darker stock. It's a 1940 play ball stock. Hmm. Really? Let's this see them one, together. The one that has 41, it's an it's a better stock card. I, I want to see what I have now. <laughs> <Hold on. laughs> it has a better, it's a it's made on a better stock. So they must have switched the stock over from so copyright Sean, to copyright 1941. Let's see the two backs next to each other on your screen here. Okay. So I'll try and give you my best examples of backs. Okay. Um, all right. So I have the copyright only 1941. Okay. So that's the back. This is the copyright 1941 back. Completely different stock. Yeah. I, one's much darker than. Yep. Now, if you compare it. I'll try and find a similar grade. So this, here's 1940. Here's the 41 copyright. The stock is the same. Huh. That's interesting. Yeah, I actually have one, too. I didn't know. Let's see it. It's interesting because I thought it was, I thought the variation was the other way, that it was just the year that the copyright. Now, I don't know. I don't know if there's a correlation to that specifically because obviously the card's in the holder. <clears throat> but the brighter front and the brighter back. Is the you can see it pretty clearly here the copyright 1941. Yep. This is uh, my signed copy. You can see that just compared, they're darker. Yeah. Now on the back, you can see here. That's different. Um, my signed is a copyright 1941. That's my signed. But you can see, Sean, like that the difference on the back is clear. No, like, I know. That's what we're just going over. It's the the copyright only is a 1940 play ball stock. Compared to a 19 one of your 1940 play balls, it looks like the same stock. <laughs> they switched the stock over and put copyright 1941 on it. Yeah, like if I'm just holding up like the other 40 play balls, like these all have the same kind of paper yep. on the back. <laughs> but you like put this one in here and it like looks, it's so much darker than everything else. But I don't know if that is specific to the paper or if it's just stained or darker. I, I don't know. I never thought of it. But it's it may be impossible for us to discern right now because we don't we can't have the card out of the holder and touch it. 
Yeah. You know, this is awesome. I mean, I'm sure if there's anybody still watching this, that they're sitting there going, these guys are going crazy over a C on the back of the car. <laughs> but it's awesome. <laughs> right? That's awesome. We got a new variation now. I had known about that, but I didn't think that I had. See, these are the two papers. Every time I look at 41 it and for the rest of my life, I'll look at the back of the card to see what kind of variation we I think you have to know. See, even the Greenberg guys are teaching each other on this thing. Isn't that amazing? See, see Michael, this is this is why I have five copies of the 41. I understand. You might have to <laughs> come with trade now. I might need to get a copyright back one or something like that. If I can pry one off of you, I'll have to go see because I've only got two. I've got a signed one and an unsigned one. Well, you don't know what you don't, you don't know what you have though. No, you I don't. Look. They're in the safe, so I mean, I'm too lazy to go get look right now. But uh, I'll check it out eventually. But that's pretty cool. I didn't know that. You would think I mean, you said you've noticed that before, Brian, or you were aware of it? Yeah, I, I knew it was a variation before, but I, I didn't think that I had I didn't think that I had one. I don't know, I the thought Super that I looked at the point and I guess I overlooked it. The Superman in the forty was kinda of like I was excited and terrified at the same time, thinking I had to <laughs> how hard it might be to find a Superman back. But it sounds like that one's, if you've already got both of them, both of you, then obviously it's probably obtainable, I would think, without too much helpful, hopefully effort. But uh, that's pretty cool. So you would think they used the same stock as the 40 initially, and then they changed over to the other stock. So which one's the stock from the 40? Is copyright or non-copyright? It just has copyright, but it doesn't have 1941. This says copyright. Okay. Yep. And that's the same stock as the forty. That seems to be to me, looking at them, it seems like the same stock as the forty. Sean, can cool. you can you grab a forty and just take a quick yeah, look? I'm, a, I'm, I'm, back. Back. I'm trying to give you one in all right. So that's a pretty good well, I'm trying to give you same condition. All right. So here's the forty. Here's the front of the 40 and the front of the 41. So I have a half a grade difference, same grader and everything, just to be as even as possible. Toning is the same. All right. Hold on. <laughs> Brian has to see him for himself. If I didn't have to get in the safe, I would get. I would check mine, Sean, but... I might have to do that later. Okay? I'm excited though to take a look at it. Did I mean, it, that, is, Sean? it is pretty similar. It's pretty, it's pretty similar. Because there are some of these 40 backs. I mean, it's pretty similar. There are some of these 40 backs that are lighter and darker, obviously. Like, like this is the darkest that I have, and this is the lightest that I have. And you can see like, there's a little bit of a variance. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why I was trying to get you as get as close to grade as I could. So we can this is, remove that. This back. is like the closest. So like the darkest forty that I have is very similar to the darkest or to the forty one without the copyright here. That's pretty similar. That's pretty similar. Yeah. Huh. But it's funny, the two low grade 41s I have are both the original back. And then the three, I guess, mid high grades, if you will, um, that I have are with the newer back. Because I have this card 
So I have a one and a three with the just copyright only back. And then I have a five, six, and seven with the copyright 1941 back. What about the, the paper versions? What do they got on the back? It's the it's the year. Copyright nineteen forty one. Yeah. Man, that's that's a mystery. Yeah, copyright forty one. That's what I have too. Huh. Good. We have another new, different uh, Greenberg in our collections now. Without go. minimal effort. <laughs> yeah, you got to go out and buy another card, Michael. No, uh, no. Dang on. No, you so say I that now. Buy, I have to buy another Greenberg. This is horrible. It's going to keep you up at night. It will. It's like when you showed me the back of that damn um, cartoon card I hate so much. What is it? That, uh... The MP and Co. Oh, my gosh. John, I hate that card. I, just... I, don't, like the... that one... huh? I, I, said, I don't like the, the, the card on the front. I love the content on the back. I do like what they say something like he's doing a swell job in the Army now. That's... Yeah. A swell job. That's a great way to describe some soldiers. He's doing a swell job. Yeah, I have the two variations of that. Which is, you're talking about this one. Yes, Brian pointed that out to me, and I, I immediately got on eBay and bought the second version the same day. It was, it was really <laughs> weird. Because like so, Brian said, that will keep me up at night until I actually get the copyright ones fixed now. so sean you're right i looked at it under a loop under my, with my loop and the paper looks the same yeah between 40 and 41. so it makes sense to say that they used up what extra they had from 40 and then when they ran out they used a different stock probably to finish the print run maybe oh. you have to think like which came first I mean, we know which came first here, but like between the between these two, like which which came first? Well, it, it makes sense to me. They probably used their surplus from the previous year first. Yeah, and probably didn't have a whole lot. Well, plus Brian, if you look at the earlier stock, so the forty stock. There's generally an oversaturation of the image on the front. So they may have seen that as an issue and decided to change the stock on it. What do you mean by oversaturation? There's a much, much darker image. Like and there's tend to be a little bit of bleeding in it compared to the newer stock. Yeah. yeah I mean, Mike, cool. you'll you'll know immediately if you have one or not. Like this is like it's been drunk in water. Does the paper version imitate the 40 style or the 40 the later style? Later 41. Yeah. Well, I mean the stock. Yeah. Yeah, 41. Yeah. The 41 is probably the it's the one with the newer stock, we think. I mean that theory makes sense. But yeah, this so is the difference. Because the last thing they would have made, I guess, would be the paper versions because paper was getting short as 41 went on in the war approach. Well, here's here's a theory. So if you have the cards being produced on the same stock as 1940, okay, and you're just churning those out, at the same time, you're going to make those promotional items. So you're going to make the paper cards, right? Someone might have looked at those papers right. and said, look, the image is better. It's clear. We need to change the stock on the regular card to match what we're giving people as a sample. So the, so the, the back actual of the paper and, matches the older stock. The, 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 it, the, does the, it have a copyright or no copyright? The, the, the quality paper. of the image um, 
may have been um, a huge factor in determining um, yeah. the switch over. Wow. It's interesting. It, that'd be a fun article to write once we could do some more research on. But from based what I've seen in mean, YouTube in your collections, it looks like it doesn't seem like one's rarer than the other, so to speak. How many have you got, Sean? Have you got how many 41s you got? How many have you got, Brian? 41s I five. And if you got three, two, four, one, how, what's the division? Of copyright, non copyright. I have two just with um, just uh, the copyright and then three with the copyright 1941. What you got, Brian? Uh, I have seven total, two paper, one with just copyright, and then the rest are with year. But it's interesting, like, the way I collect, if this card were not autographed, I would never seek it out to buy it. I think the color is terrible. Yep. But, like, you, like there's no comparison between like between the color on these three and the color of this like if this were not autographed i would never seek this out to buy it yeah right i would not want to have this in my collection i don't think it's a good, a good representation of the card yeah i'll give you i'll try and hold up the two so if you're just looking at the front right. very so interesting here's, here's the just copyright only versus copyright 1941. Yeah. Yeah, I mean you, you would tell you can you can tell immediately. There's 41. And there's just copyright. And I'm, I'm within two grades. Huh. That is really cool. Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> well, guys, I might like wrap up here, I think. Let's see. The interesting yep. thing is that so the 40 play ball is very similar to the ticket cardboard that was used at the time so if you can see the flaking and everything is very similar to what you'd find on the 1940 play ball what year is that stuff from 1940 1940 so same similar type of cardboard with similar issues of the flaking around the edges how the corners specifically round um so the stock was a standard cardboard stock is what it looks like to me Huh. It is interesting. Very interesting. We'll have yeah. to keep you up for a countless number of nights to go forward. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, well, we actually learned something ourselves today. That's pretty good. We did. We made a discovery within our, with, within our triad. Another variation, Michael. You have a new project now, so yes, I do. I'll be scouring eBay now. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I think we'll wrap it up. Yep. We're at we're right at two hours. I think we've talked about a lot. So oh, was, wow, that was the past two hours. Was very good. successful. That was fun. Enjoyed it, guys. It's really good. Likewise, and we'll come back when we have more things to talk about. Yeah, I'll show you my new 41 when we get on next time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, all. Take all care. Right. Thanks for watching. Guys, all thanks right. for joining. Talking to you guys. And thank you all, all for right. watching. I guess we should have paid more attention to our followers. <laughs> I just get lost in conversation, though. It's just kind of, yeah. Anyway, thanks, guys. Let's do this again soon. Here. All right. Enjoy yes, the sir. Talk to you. Take care, you all. Bye-bye. Yeah, how are we going? All right, bye.